Hi, I'm Mark Bucker, and I'm running for Clearwater City Council. Last night, I spoke at the Downtown Development Board meeting. As journalist Tracy McManus of the Tampa Bay Times reported, this board is now the first panel comprised of primarily Scientologists. So I want to show you my comments from the meeting. I'm going to play this uninterrupted. I want to put it in a tiny bit of context before I show it to you, and then we'll go into far greater detail after the comments are over. And then we'll get to the response from the, the board after that. But, um, you know, I talked about, it's, it will seem like I'm talking about Scientology's beliefs. I usually don't do this. I, I only brought it up as a topic, and I felt this would be about the only time I really should, because at the last meeting, one of the board members, Ray Cassano, offered that he was a Scientologist and also a Christian and that most Scientologists are Christians. Now, uh, I already did a, vi a video about Scientology and other beliefs, and I urge you to watch that. Um, talking about how Scientology will tell you that it's compatible with all the other religions, but as you go further and further up the bridge, the more pressure is put on you to stop being a Muslim, a Jew, a Christian, whatever practices you're, you're doing, and become strictly a Scientologist. I'll always hear uh, Scientologists uh, on the radio, for instance, being interviewed, and they'll say, oh, we're completely compatible with Christianity. Um, if I were the interviewer, I'd say, oh yeah, well, let's take a listen to this. So afterwards, <laughs> we'll take a listen to some of the things that I reference in this talk. Next is citizens to be heard regarding items not on the agenda. Are there any citizens to be heard? Okay, you uh, please state your name and address and limit your comments. Need my address? To, okay. Your name and address and limit your comments to three minutes. All right, thank you. thank you. My name is Mark Bunker. I live at 1200 South Missouri Avenue. And um, at the last meeting, I was speaking about Scientology's negative impact on downtown Clearwater. And while I didn't bring up religious beliefs, Mr. Cassano offered the fact that he is a Scientologist and a Christian and that most Scientologists, he said, are Christians. And I'm not going to challenge Mr. Cassano's personal religious beliefs. I mean, anyone is allowed to believe anything that they want. This is a, this is a, a comment you hear frequently, both in person and from people in the media. Scientology, they say, is completely compatible with any other religion. And they say that practically everywhere, except in the paperwork filed with the IRS, where they are trying to receive their tax-exempt status. In there, they state that members are expected to essentially abandon their prior beliefs and practice only Scientology, and that was a key factor toward getting their tax-exempt status. So while it's tempting to say that I don't doubt you, Mr. Cassano, when it comes to Scientology, there really is nothing but doubt. Scientology's inability to be truthful is one of the reasons that the group has such a terrible reputation to begin with and why having Scientologists now in the majority controlling the downtown redevelopment board is so troubling to many. And again, people can believe anything that they want. But how can Scientology be completely compatible with Christianity? When L. Ron Hubbard himself said, there was no Christ, that some madmen 2,000 years ago stumbled upon some of Hubbard's tech and misinterpreted the man on the cross. The, uh, the man on the cross, according to Hubbard, is every man. Hubbard also referred to the Church of, uh, the Church of Satan's founder, Alistair, McCrow uh, I'm sorry, Alistair Crowley, as my good friend. And he did that in an audio tape lecture that was given to Scientologists. Now, I know people can pick and choose whatever aspects they want to believe in any religion. I mean, you don't need to believe in talking snakes to be a Christian. You do, however, kind of have to believe in Christ. And again, believe anything you want. But the further you go along in Scientology, the greater the pressure is put on you to stop uh, practicing what uh, Scientology refers to as other practices. Of course, by then, tales of talking snakes have been replaced by Hubbard's hard, cold historical fact 
that we're all blown up in a volcano 75 million years ago by an evil intergalactic overlord named Xenu. But as I say, I really don't care what Scientology believes. I just wish that Scientology believed in the truth. Thank you. I wanted to give you uh, just a little context of the, uh, the few things that I mentioned in there. For instance, the clip of Hubbard saying there was no Christ. Uh, every man is then shown to have been crucified, so don't think that it's an accident that this crucifixion they found out that this applied. Somebody somewhere on this planet, back about 600 B.C., found some pieces of R6. And I don't know how they found it, either by watching Mad Men or something, but since that time they have used it, and it became what is known as Christianity. Uh, the man on the cross, there was no Christ. But the man on the cross is shown as every man, so of course each person seeing a crucified man has an immediate feeling of sympathy for this man. Therefore you get many PCs who says they are Christ. Now there's two reasons for that. One is the Roman Empire was prone to crucify people. So a person can have been crucified. But in R6, he is shown as crucified. Now, here's the tricky thing. Hubbard was such a prolific BSer that he said contradictory things on every subject all the time. So here he's saying there was no Christ. Other places he said, yeah, there is a Christ. He was one of the great teachers on this planet. My favorite is perhaps when he said on Hubbard's bridge to total freedom, Jesus falls a, a little bit shy of the state of clear. So imagine if Hubbard been around to get Jesus onto the bridge and up to the OT levels, he really could have made something of himself. So I'm not suggesting that everyone in Scientology believes there was no Christ. Of course not. But it's not as simple as Scientology would like you to believe. Yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely. It's completely compatible. Uh, the magic cults of the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries in the Middle East were fascinating. The only modern work that has anything to do with them is trifle wild in spots, but it's fascinating work in itself, and that's work written by Alastair Crowley, the late Alastair Crowley, my very good friend. And uh, he, he did himself a splendid uh, piece of aesthetics built around those magic cults. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, reading to get a hold of a copy of a book, quite rare, but it can be obtained. The Master Therian, T-H-E-R-I-N, The Master Therian by Alastair Crowley. He signs himself The Beast, The Mark of the Beast, 666. Hubbard had this bizarre relationship with the occult. And it's usually something I don't talk about because it is so over the top that people just think, oh, come on, you're just laying it on now. You're making stuff up. But I'm not. <laughs> when Hubbard got out of the uh, uh, service in World War II, rather than going back to the Midwest to his wife, he decided to kick around L.A. for a while. And he moved into a, a mansion in Pasadena that had rooms for rent to um, colorful characters. They, it, it, the ad for the, for the home was, we want artists, we want eccentrics, we don't want the button-down types, essentially. And Hubbard said, that sounds good to me. So he wound up at, at the home of Jack Parsons, who was a rocket scientist and one of the uh, people behind the founding of JPL in South Pasadena. Uh, so the other thing about Jack Parsons that was uh, kind of important was that he was, uh, he believed in the occult and, um, and Aleister Crowley. Uh, and when Hubbard knocked at his door and, and came to live there for a while, Hubbard and, and Jack Parsons engaged in sex magic rituals, as they call them. Uh, eventually everything fell apart when Hubbard decided, hey, you know what, what would be a good idea, Jack? Give me some money. 
I'm going to go to the East Coast. You stay here in the West Coast. Oh, and I'm going to take your girlfriend with you, with me too, okay? And I'll buy us some ships and we'll make money and we'll sail the ships back here and, and uh, it'll be great. It'll be a great uh, enterprise. We'll make a ton of money. Well, uh, Hubbard made off with the money and the girl, but he wasn't bringing the ships back. And Jack Parsons freaked out and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, tried to have him arrested. Um, but so this, this fascinating chapter of Hubbard's life was well documented. And in 1968, Scientology actually had to address it. And the way they explained it, and, and I've been told that L. Ron Hubbard himself wrote this explanation in 1968 that the FBI sent Hubbard in as a spy to break up this occult group. <laughs> and break it up he did. You know, he, he ran off with the money and the girl. Uh, so, I mean, that's, but that's such a spectacularly insane story. I usually don't share it. So that, that's the, um, you know, that's the reason why I, I brought that up. Scientology is, in many ways, a bait and switch religion. You come in thinking it's one thing. Oh, we can help you with your relationship. We can help you communicate better. We can uh, improve uh, your financial status. Come in and take some courses. And the early courses are all about you, 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 how to improve your life. And as you get going on to the Bridge to Total Freedom, which are the increasingly expensive series of courses, you are having more and more revealed along the way. And I mentioned OT3 and Xenu. Most Scientologists don't know anything about Xenu until they've been in for years and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars. You get into a room, you're shown this material, and then everything changes. Because now it's not about you anymore. It's not you going back through your past problems and and sorting out your issues in your life. Now, you discover everything started 75 million years ago when this evil intergalactic uh, overlord put us in the volcanoes and blew us up. And now we're covered with what's called body things, little remnants of uh, spirits that were fused together in the explosion and attached themselves to our bodies. And those are really the cause of your problem. So for the the remainder of your time in Scientology, it's, it, it shifts into not you that you're handling, but these beings around you, BTs, body things. So that's why, you know, I brought up all of these little issues. But the main point was not that uh, they're they're devil worshipers, don't believe in Jesus, is that Scientology doesn't, doesn't believe in the truth. And I, I, think, I think that's an important point to understand. Let's go on to the response. I'm going to take a few minutes. I hope you'll be patient with me. But I've twice now Mr. Bunker has come to this meeting. And you'll notice I did not seek him out. He came and sought me out. And he has twice now tried to harass and intimidate after the first meeting, which, it, which he was trying to encourage people not to vote for me on the basis of my religion. Okay, that's bigotry. That's bigotry. Nothing else. Since that time, I've been subjected to a campaign on social media of harassment, intimidation, and unpleasant communications. I'm not interested in having any more of it. Now, I think that following your comments today again about our history goes back a long way. I think it's fair for me to take a couple minutes to give you some information on what that history actually is. Okay? Mr. Bunker is posing as a concerned citizen, trying to alert the citizenry to the perils of Scientology. However, you need to know a little bit more about Mr. Bunker before you venture into his camp and lend him your support. He has for over 20 years done what he can to harm the church 
and to intimidate, harass, and drive off the Scientologists, who in his opinion infest the downtown. He's planning to run for city council. His only apparent platform plank is his intention to stifle and contain Scientology and Scientologists. On the face of it, a purely bigoted and intolerant approach. If you would, for a moment, take any of his written or public comments and substitute the word Jew for Scientologist, then it would become very clear to you what we're talking about. The level of bigotry we haven't seen since the brown shirts wandered around Germany in the 20s. Almost 100 years ago, in Germany, an, ide an ideologue named Adolf ran for public office, warning about the threat posed by the Jews to their communities and urging that something be done about them. We all know how that turned out. If Mr. Bunker has any achievements or successes in his life, I'm unaware of them. I know little of the career of this man over the years, other than the years that he spent attacking Scientology as a professional bigot. The only regular paid employment that I'm aware of in the last 25 years. There might be, but I'm not aware of it. Back in the late 90s, Mr. Bunker was a paid demonstrator of the anti-Scientology group funded by Robert Minton. A lot of you were not here then, so I'll tell you, I'll spend a couple of minutes on that. Mr. Minton had been seduced and co-opted by an anti-Scientologist woman who not only ruined his marriage of many years, but convinced him to spend millions of dollars to fund a campaign against Scientology in Clearwater. He eventually discovered that he'd been duped. He ended up testifying against his former collaborators who had been suing the church for millions of dollars in a phony case so they could financially benefit. However, for a number of years, Mr. Bunker dutifully and eagerly demonstrated against the church regularly, never missed an opportunity to harass and intimidate individual Scientologists. How do I know this? I was there. I was one of them. Purely to harass, he would walk up to the front of my store windows, place his video camera against the glass, and videotape me or my staff or my customers, and take video footage and then presumably to post it on the internet or something like that. We were just going about our business. What was the purpose of this other than to harass or intimidate? Then he would follow Scientologists like myself around downtown, videotaping while making goading comments in hope of getting better footage. I learned that footage of myself was being regularly posted on the internet in an effort to discredit me. It's still there. He's still emailing it around today. But Mr. Bunker did not limit himself to following adults. He also stalked the minor children of Scientologists, which seems a bit like a bridge too far, doesn't it? Following them around downtown and videotaping them in an effort to intimidate them. How do I know this? My daughter was one of them. On at least two occasions, you did that. This greatly upset her. It angered me. You have to understand that Mr. Bunker was not an ex-Scientologist with some supposed grievance. He had no motive at all that I'm aware of other than money. I think he chose the profession of professional bigot because it paid better than his earlier gig and perhaps because it offered him a way to bully others and feed a small ego. He made his living by discriminating against Scientologists and he had a, the gall to file a complaint against me with the Human Rights Commission. He actually took me to court in the Human Rights Commission for religious discrimination. Well, it took about five minutes to dismiss that case when I appeared before the commissioner and I explained to him that I'd not discriminated against Mr. Bunker on the basis of his religion, whatever that might be, but purely because of his resemblance to a particular human orifice. Apologies to anyone that's offended. As Jews in Germany had a right to a place to live without persecution and harassment, so do Scientologists in Clearwater. I urge the public not to listen to the hateful propaganda of Mr. Bunker, the Times, the other agents of hate that spew this constant litany of garbage about me and my fellow Scientologists. We have a right to be here. We are contributing members of this community. We pay our taxes. We volunteer. <laughs> we contribute significantly to our local economy. We don't do drugs. We don't commit crimes. We harm no one. We are people of goodwill. We've chosen Clearwater as our home. We're not going anywhere. Allow us and help us to make Clearwater the bright and sparkling jewel of Tampa Bay 
and don't pay attention to fools and bigots. Thank you. With that, I call this meeting adjourned. When I talk about Scientology telling the truth, it would have been good if he had told the truth about all of these charges he leveled against me. He accused me of following his children and, and filming his children. I didn't even know he had children. And I have not followed and filmed any Scientology children over the years. There's been a couple exceptions. One is um, a piece of video that I put up a few years ago about a Boy Scout leader, a Scientologist Boy Scout leader, who was introducing his little kids to Bob Minton. So kids, this is Mr. Bob Minton. These guys, the guy who is paying for these Nazis to come do this in our country. <laughs> this is the man who takes out his wallet and pays for Nazis to come disturb the peace in our country. So now take a good look at evil, and, and there you, it is. And if your dad will let you listen for one minute, I believe in the Scientology creed where it says people have the right to speak freely, to think freely, and write or criticize the opinions of others. So are we preventing him from doing that, Kate? No. Is he out here on the street right here in front of us saying things that we know aren't true? But Scientology... And are we preventing him from doing that? Scientology's Office of Special Affairs tries to destroy his families. Ninety-five percent of the Scientologists are wonderful people. Let me orient her to the yeah. Office of Special Affairs. You remember the night that we went to the big party in L.A. and I introduced you to Heber Gent? Yeah. Big tall Heber? Yeah. Okay. He's one of the guys at the very top of the Office of Special Affairs. You remember him? Now, is he a good guy or a bad guy? Good guy. There you go. So, he's talking about, about Heber Jinch, our friend, when he says that. What do you think, Kate? I don't think so either. Okay, so let's go well, in you together, guys, guys. You guys have a good day, and I appreciate your stopping and talking. I appreciate it. We certainly Take will care. continue. Now, I waited until these kids were grown up before I put this online. The only other time I, I shot video of children was at a Lisa McPherson memorial picket back in 1999. People from all over the world would come in on December 5th to protest and have a memorial for Lisa McPherson, who died under Scientology's care. This year, which was the first year that I actually was in Clearwater to, to, to film the memorial and all the activity around that, Scientology pulled out the stops to prevent protests around their buildings. Here's what they did at the Fort Harrison Hotel. They actually tore up every single sidewalk surrounding the hotel just so you couldn't walk on the sidewalk around them to just prevent somebody from saying, hey, Scientology, um, there's something hinky here. You know, this woman died under your care, and it's not right. The other thing they did on Cleveland Street, they stationed children at a little craft table, like one every block or so. These kids were forced to sit out there on the empty street, no traffic, they were sitting out there doing crafts. Why? To make it look like critics of Scientology were protesting little children. These poor kids had to sit out there for hours. It just struck me as another amazing example of how Scientology doesn't care. They don't care about the, the children in their, uh, in their care. <laughs> you know, they, uh, so what? They have to sit out there in the street. If you're worried about protesters, if you're worried they're, they're going to be scared of all the protesters, like, like um, the Morphopolis 
said his daughters were terrified, then why station the kids out there and leave them there all day long? Why? The point is they just want to make protesters look bad. So Paris said that I, um, I would frequently be pressing my camera against the, the window of his store, the one-stop shop, uh, harassing him and his uh, employees. I shot hundreds of hours of footage in Clearwater in LA. I have one shot looking through the window. What I'm showing you now is Bob Minton, the man that Paris demeaned in his comments. Bob Minton was a great man, a good man, a decent man, and a hero. And Jamie DeWolf, L. Ron Hubbard's great-grandson. Jamie went in by Bob and I thought, well, here's something interesting. Uh, let me get a little footage of Bob and Jamie uh, inside the store. They didn't make a scene. They didn't uh, cause a commotion. Bob bought something, which I used to do all the time before Paris uh, booted me out. I was a, a fairly regular shopper there. Uh, they also had a mail drop in the back for uh, FedEx or UPS, I forget which. Um, foolhardy, I guess, but there were times when I would drop off packages there. So I, I wasn't necessarily a stranger to the one-stop shop. I would go and, and drop off a package or, or, or buy a soda. You know, is that so horrible? And when Paris says that I was following him all around Clearwater, if I had more footage of Paris, I would show it to you. The only footage that I believe I have, and I've, I've looked through all of this uh, over the years, is the little clip that I showed you from Watterson Street, where he approached me. So until you lose some weight, get the hell away from me, you know? Are you on your 50 Twinkie a day habit now, or what? If you can't control your eating habits, Mark, what about your sexual habits? What, what, where do they run to? Small children? Huh? Animals? What is it, small barnyard animals? What does it for you? Little boys? And he's alleging that I said those same types of things provoking him. I never did. I never would. I let people talk to the camera and let the Scientologists speak for themselves. You know, Paris can make up these stories. Mr. Bunker is posing as a concerned citizen. He has for over 20 years done what he can to harm the church and to intimidate, harass, and drive off the Scientologists who, in his opinion, infest the downtown. The level of bigotry we haven't seen since the brown shirts wandered around Germany in the 20s. This is the way Scientology works. Scientology tries to dig up dirt on you. And when they can't, they make it up. I was stalking his kids. I terrified his kids. I told people not to vote for Paris because he's a Scientologist. I didn't advise anybody to vote one way or the other. I said there's an election coming up. The, uh, there's a great number of Scientologists on the board right now, Paris is one of them, of the next slate. Three of the five are Scientologists, and very likely Scientologists will be uh, the majority of the people on the board. I didn't say don't vote for Paris or any Scientologist. I said this is the situation. This is what it is. And because of that, my, my message to Paris and the Scientologists on the board in the previous week was be aware that a big problem downtown is Scientology. And so, as Scientologists, you have a hurdle to overcome to make it welcoming, to invite people back there and feel comfortable. Is this the way to do it? From your position of power as the chairman of the board, to sit there with a prepared statement and smear a citizen, to make up lies, it's outrageous. 
This is Scientology in action. And that's what I try to show with my camera whenever possible. I don't know Paris. I don't know anything about them. The one interaction I had with him hasn't been positive, but that doesn't mean he's, he's not a good guy. I'm not going to make any judgment on that. But Scientology forces a judgment on its members by telling them, as L. Ron Hubbard said, anyone who criticizes Scientology is a criminal. Just look up their crimes to silence them. And if you can't find any, manufacture them. Now they're being manufactured in the city chambers from a board president on live streaming video to the entire city. Is that right? If the roles were reversed, I wouldn't do that. You want to come up, even if, if Paris was uh, speaking his mind and I was there, I wouldn't attack him any more than I'm attacking him now. I mean, it, it's, it's sheer insanity. But Scientology has got this foothold in the city, and they, they lead by intimidation. And we have to be able to say, I'm not intimidated. That strips their power away. The city has got to be able to say the word Scientology and stand up to them. I'm not saying we're going to kick Scientology out of town. I'm not saying that Scientologists are bad people or that they shouldn't be involved in the downtown. I'm saying that they should learn how to be good neighbors like they pretend to be, and then maybe people will start to treat them a little differently. I don't think it's a, <laughs> I don't think it's a tough uh, ask. Except, well, I won't go into it. You know, when, if, if you can't change the teachings of your founder, L. Ron Hubbard, um, and Hubbard tells you to do one thing, you, you just keep doing it that way. Um, but I always hope. I always hope there can be a change. Anyway, I, I, I've talked long enough. Come and visit my website at markbunker.com, and don't forget to donate. I will see you online, and hopefully uh, at the polls next March.